will be covering water. Um, and as I said, we've got three great speakers lined up. So our first speaker today, who most of you will know on the call, is Dr. Anne Wheeler. Um, Anne's an environmental scientist through and through with her focus on hydrology and aquatic science. And she's worked at Wolverhampton University and Austin University. She is the chair of the Seven Rivers Trust. Um, she's also the chair of our industrial advisory board here at the University of Chester. She's a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and a Forestry Commission appointee um, as part of the Forestry and Woodland Advisory Committee in the West Midlands. Um, Anne is absolutely committed to catchment management in, in everything she does and for the, for the improvement of, of our rivers and, and catchments. Um, so I shall hand over to you and talk about the introduction to natural capital approach. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. Uh, it took a moment or two to get my microphone to turn on. Um, thank you for that kind introduction, uh, uh, Juliana. Um, I've got to say, I was asked to provide a short introduction to natural capital uh, by Steve Buss, and I think you've just covered it more succinctly than perhaps I'm going to do, but I'm, I'm perhaps going to come at it from a, a similar viewpoint, but uh, with some slightly different information, perhaps. Okay, Kat, can you... Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, the stock of natural capital, um, natural assets, uh, the stock is, uh, let me start again, sorry. Natural capital is the stock of natural assets upon which an economy and society is built. Um, these next couple of slides, I'm going to draw on some of the words of Dieter Helm, the Professor of Economic Policy uh, at Oxford University. And he's also the chair of the government's Natural Capital Committee. And he states that, uh, as Juliana did uh, said, that nature provides these assets for free and will continue to do so if we treat the environment well. So thinking about the sustainability of those assets and actually paying back as uh, to the debt that we have to nature. Uh, natural capital has become the currency with regard to talking about the environment that can be quite uh, controversial, and I, I hope I'm not misquoting John George Mionbio, who is not entirely happy happy about natural capital accounting, and uh, it being regarded as a currency. But I'll I'll explain. I'm sympathetic with him, but I'll explain why. Perhaps it's uh, a useful thing to think about. Um, also, uh, Dieter Helm uh, stated the maintenance of our natural capital is essential for a sustainable economy and a sustainable society um, because there are these uh, less visible uh, ecosystem services that can accrue to us as a, a, a society. He really stated that baseline surveys are really essential to our understanding what natural capital we have. How can we protect our natural capital and pay back into nature if we don't understand what's there in the first place? And he, uh, like me, thinks that the catchment approach provides a really uh, opportunity for an integrated approach of reviewing ecosystems, the natural capital, and to think about all the stakeholders that are involved within the catchment that we need to consider. Next slide, please. So thinking about the baseline surveys, as I said, we need to know what there is there already and how to protect it. A catchment or sub catchments are the natural units and a very sensible way to think about how we can divide the landscape into um, uh, partitions that we can actively go and audit for the natural capital. And also catchments are integrated systems, so we can look at them holistically and try to think of them systematically, so not just 
we'll look at what trees are there, we'll look at what soils are there, what water assets we have within the catchment, but think of it in a holistic, systematic way as a series of systems. We also think need to think about the partnerships who are going to help us undertake these survey, surveys. Uh, water companies are, are essential in, in perhaps helping us with data and information uh, that, about the water that's being used. We need to work with local authorities, clearly with landowners and farmers, because we need to be able to access land and understand what they know about their land. We need to work with various trusts. So the National Trust is one of the biggest landowners in the UK. There's the Wildlife Trust, the Rivers Trust. There are a whole uh, raft of uh, environmental bodies that can help in undertaking these audits. And then, of course, there's uh, the government uh, uh, um, agencies like the Environment Agency, Natural England, Forestry England and the Forestry Commission and Natural Resources Wales and up in Scotland it, it will be their environmental uh, agency in Scotland. But we shouldn't forget these other partners that we might have because they're really essential for understanding what uh, ecosystem services can be accrued. So we might have our angling trusts who really have a really uh, important understanding of our water bodies and our water courses. There might be boating communities, there could be uh, in urban areas how uh, the rivers or uh, what recreation is taking place and recreational, spla recreational space that is within the catchment. And we shouldn't forget the communities that are part of them. Citizen science is becoming more and more uh, active in, in helping us to understand our, our, our uh, environment. And so they can be a really important part in helping us understand uh, not just the actual things like water quality and, and uh, uh, what plants and understanding of ecology, but also to understand how communities use uh, 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 their space and what uh, natural capital is that is perhaps less visible uh, in these audits. Next slide, please. So Dieter Helm suggests that the catchment is the obvious way to divide the landscape, and I wouldn't disagree with him for that. He also emphasised this looking at catchment as systems not just as individual elements, but how they integrated together. We need to understand what is there to ensure that when we're doing one thing within a catchment area that we may think is enhancement, can we be certain that we're not actually causing decline elsewhere? So if we can look at the system as a whole, we can consider if we're doing something that we feel is beneficial at the top of a catchment, is it really uh, being helpful to the catchment and to the natural capital in other parts of the catchment? And so if you think about water, we should look at all aspects of, of the water within the catchment, not just water quality or water quantity, but it could also be water uh, volatility. So that uh, those rapid changes that can happen be between uh, a lack of water and then suddenly we've got too much water uh, in our catchment. Um, we need to also think about the flood risk ma management and we need to think that water is a finite resource that interacts with the whole system, that we need uh, water for everything we do. It underpins uh, what, what we do within the whole system. So it, it's really a uh, an important aspect to look at, but not to be looked at in isolation. Next slide, please. I just wanted to uh, uh, comment on, uh, with my other slight hat on, of sitting in the Forestry and Woodland Advisory Committee for the West Midlands. Um, 
I've been away for a number of years that Forestry England actually started to produce natural capital accounts uh, in 2015. Um, there's very good guidance on methodology in uh, the UK uh, Natural Accounts uh, 2020, which is provided by the Office of National Statistics. Um, it's very thorough, but um, different bodies, uh, and it, this can be an issue, do slightly flex that methodology um, and it's still a learning experience about how we best uh, look at what natural capital we have within a catchment or with, in this case, the forest estate within England. Um, and the for Forestry in England would be the first to say have flexed uh, their uh, methodology uh, over the years since 2015. But their approach is that they've had a balance sheet where they've looked at uh, what they have and what they use. They've produced an asset register. They've thought about the physical and monetary fold, uh, flows. And more recently, they've really started to consider carbon sequestration to estimate the uh, amount of carbon that's sequestered in the soils in the forest estate and in the litter as well as in the trees so this is why i say you can't just look at the tree uh trees within the forest estate you need to look at everything in uh 2018 uh the forestry england estimated that their natural capital had a value of around uh, 26 billion pounds for that year. And then interestingly, uh, in the most recent one in 2019-2020, they estimated that it had slightly reduced due to reduced visitor numbers. Um, and so only estimated it as 24 billion pounds for the year. It will be very interesting to see how they estimate uh, their natural capital value in the next year when uh, visitor numbers seem to have risen very sharply uh, during lockdown as um, many visitor centres and visitor areas on the, the forest estate have been a source of opportunity for people to uh, exercise and, and have recreation. Uh, next slide, please. There's, I'm sorry if you can't see this as clearly, but there's actually a very good uh, um, overview, if you like, of uh, a diagram showing the natural potential natural capital within the forestry estate uh, that they produced in 2017 and what the benefits that can accrue from that natural capital. So... They've identified looking at the ecological communities, the soils, the fresh water, the land as a whole, the minerals that uh, are within uh, underlie the area of the forest estate, the atmosphere, uh, the subsoil assets and uh, the oceans. Um, Although they sort of touch on atmosphere, there is now a, another part, as I said, where they're thinking about the climate more likely, um, uh, looking at the climate uh, within this and thinking about carbon sequestration. But if we take the fresh water um, benefits, the, um, the ecosystem benefits that can accrue, it's not just having clean drinking water, but it's providing good water quality for other ecosystems to benefit. It's also for thinking about recreation, um, and that could be uh, wild swimming, for instance, and boating and angling, and those health and well-being benefits that accrue from allowing uh, recreation. But there's also the educational benefits that are on there, the biodiversity and conservation benefits, those larger amenity benefits uh, that uh, are accrued uh, and have uh, a value um, with, uh, that accrues from the natural capital. Uh, next slide, please. 
And just one very short slide about uh, a project that Seven Rivers Trust are involved in, and it's called the WISE Project. It's funded by the EU uh, uh, and uh, the Nas uh, Heritage Lottery Funding. And uh, it's a project on the Y, the Ithian and uh, Seven ecosystem. So the Seven is looking at places like Camlad, uh, Gillsfield Brook, the team, and we're working uh, with farmers, with the Y and Us Foundation, who are the lead partner, uh, particularly focusing on the Y, Nissan uh, catchments, and uh, working with farmers to improve soil quality, uh, to reduce diffuse and point source pollution, increase woodland cover, um, all of the things that you can see here. Um, and we're trying to help them protect uh, create a much more sustainable farm business and natural environment. However, we can't start to help them though, with those things unless we have a baseline survey in those catchments so we can understand the natural capital and the value of that natural capital is there. And so we've been working with farmers, with landowners to map those catchments to try and help them understand what value they have in their own on their own land, their own estates, but in the wider catchment as well. And so we're looking to project, um, uh, develop opportunities so that we can have uh, payments for ecosystem services. Um, like the government was saying, um, public money for public goods. And also uh, though ecosystem services by thinking how we can reduce phosphate, for instance, and uh, um, benefit by putting in place um, initiatives for natural flood management. But again, making sure that when we put some of those um, uh, amelioration initiatives in, that we're not causing any damage further down in a catchment or in other areas. That's uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is one of my last slides, but it's very recent and uh, it's only come out in 2021. But there is, uh, you may have heard of it already, the Descupta uh, review on the economics of biodiversity. And although it's not focused on natural capital itself, it's uh, identified nature as our most precious asset. And I think that really shows that even people coming from a slightly different viewpoint than, say, the Natural Capital Commission uh, are actually uh, identifying nature as something we really do need to take care of. Uh, the emphasis in this report is on biodiversity uh, enabling nature to be productive, to provide us some of, the, some of those services for our economy, for our society, for our cultural well-being, uh, to how we can make uh, biodiversity and our nature more resilient and possibly make it more adaptable when we think of to, in terms of climate change. Uh, the report really does suggest that our current engagement with that nature is unsustainable as it is now. So we need to think how we can improve things and what we can do to pay back our debt to nature. And the review also states that our economies are embedded within nature and they're not external to it. And we need to remember that. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things uh, that um, we need to think about is how we fund some of the works to enhance our catchments and it, pay back some of our debt to uh, natural capital. Um, and we need to pr find funding to do that. Uh, a potential funding stream for uh, farmers, for landowners, may well be through the government's uh, environmental land management scheme, ELMS, that will come online. Um, and also the water companies are realising they need to invest in nature 
to potentially help them meet their statutory targets and uh, they need to move towards walking, uh, working towards enhancement of our catchments and our, our water courses rather than trying to just simply cleaning up of the mess. And a number of companies, very large uh, financial companies, are starting to think in terms of carbon offsetting and green investment. Uh, also, uh, through DEFRA, natural flood risk management has come much more to the fore. And DEFRA and Treasury are now committed to spending uh, £50 million pounds on trees. My only concern is that they need to make sure that the right trees are being planted in the right places for the right reasons. But all of these things here uh, are driven by um, an understanding of the value of our natural capital. So although some um, people are, are rather reluctant to think about nature having a, a um, financial value, it is the language of many of these funders. Even the large companies that are thinking about invest green investment, think in terms of cost benefit analysis. So although I would personally prefer that we didn't have to put a uh, financial value on our natural capital, it is the language with which we need to engage with many of uh, our large companies, our water companies, even uh, DEFRA and the Treasury think in terms of cost benefit analysis. So unless we can change that view and change that focus on a monetary value, I, I think we do have to uh, still have that audit that allows us to put our best estimate about what the value is and that's what the for forestry england uh has been trying to do over the last six or seven years uh, and it does help inform some of their investment and some of uh, uh, their works that they undertake within the forest estate within england so they find it useful to have taken a, a view of uh that uh, going forward. And the final slide is really just a reference slide that if in case anybody wants to uh, look at uh, the Descupta review, it's quite a long report, but there is a summary report that you can download. It's quite interesting to look at Forestry England and their natural capital accounts because it's quite interesting to see how their capital accounting has um, uh, evolved over since 2015 and I will be really interested to see what they come up with uh, in the next year. Um, if you're interested in what Dieter Helm has to uh, say um, and I drew on some of his talk to the Wyanoss Foundation uh, in January, um, he, if you look at his books and there, there are some really he writes in a very accessible way, uh, and and if you hear him talk, he talks in a very accessible way, much better than I do about natural capital. Um, and then there are the guidance for uh, natural capital accounts um, uh, produced by the Office of National Statistics, which you may uh, want to look at. Um, I... <laughs> I, I don't know, uh, Juliana, I've noticed there are a couple of questions. I've come to the end of what I have to say, but whether there are some questions to, to answer. Vicky, sorry. It's Vicky, fine. I, it's I, absolutely I, fine. Yes, yeah, Sam, there's, uh, there's just two questions there. So um, if I just read it out and, and you have a go answering it. So um, from yeah. Paul Lindup. Hi, Paul. Um, funds and flooding. Any thoughts on deflecting flood resilience funding? into flood prevention and boosting of natural capital? I do have some thoughts because I, I used to be in my past life the, the um, chair of uh, the 7 and Y Regional Flood and Coastal Committee and with another committee member, uh, John, um, uh, God, his name's just gone, he's a really close friend of mine, 
But anyway, another another member of the committee and I really um, quite early on uh, made a decision that we wanted to think in terms of uh, flood resilience and flood management in terms of uh, integrated catchment management. And we were able at a very early stage to um, put some of the local levy, which is the monies from the local authorities, the eight local authorities in the catchment, towards uh, developing a natural flood management approach uh, long before really um, DEFRA and, and NERC got involved with it. And, and because we'd started early, particularly uh, down in Stroud, um, uh, on the River Frome and the Slad, uh, River Slad, um, that we actually were able to draw down quite a lot of funding to do some schemes. I do think um, there is an argument for a blended approach to flood risk management. Um, there are good reasons why there should be some capital projects, but I would like to see a much more balanced approach to funding going into more nat working with natural processes, because there are other benefits accru that accrue, not just in slowing the flow and ameliorating uh, the worst of the flood peaks that can that happen. There's also the benefits of increased biodiversity, increased educational benefits, um, quite often increased recreational benefits that come the engagement with local communities and getting people involved in the citizen science, but also monitoring uh, the, the effectiveness of some of uh, the natural um, flood management techniques that have been implied. Uh, and it's not just about leaky dams, it's also about flood alleviation pools and, and earth buns that are, are um, a, a bit like the Argies along the Severn uh, uh, north of Shrewsbury, uh, that we can think about how a much more integrated approach. Um, uh, and I think there is a move in the next six year round to have a much more integrated, blended approach to some of the bigger projects uh, that the EA will be fund the DEFRA and EA will be funding. Uh, and I really uh, welcome that very much. Sorry, a long-winded answer. That's my answer. Actually, covered a lot of ground there. Thank you, <laughs> Anne. Um, there's another question here from Susie Roy. Um, how much do the general public value water? Most folk don't know where the water in their tap comes from or where wastewater goes. What can be done to change that? Um. Interestingly, and I wouldn't say it's just a book, I would say because it I'm part of the Seven Rivers Trust, but um, a lot of uh, uh, rivers trusts are working actively working with local communities, with volunteers, but actually going into an awful lot of schools. And if we can engage our young people in understanding that the water uh, that they use, where it comes from, that when they use the toilet and maybe flush a wet wipe down the, the toilet, what effect it might have in the in our water quality, for instance, how we can reduce our use of phosphates in maybe washing up in and things of that nature in our cleaning products. Um, but it's it's helping our young people to realise that um, nature is a really uh, lovely and enjoyable place to be and that if we can show them that if we look after our water and think about how what they do when they have baths and showers and so on affects our, our water supply and our the quantity and quality of our water um, then they go home, they talk to their parents, they get their parents to go out and engage. And, and I think it is a, a long term picture. And I know lots of uh, um, Rivers Trusts are doing things. And uh, Eden, I was only on the Rivers Trust annual conference uh, last two days. And the Eden Rivers Trust have got something done uh, that they call Source to Tap. Um, and uh, it's thinking about these real things about. Where's our water come from? What what does it do for us? But then 
how does it come out as that drinking water quality that when we turn the tap on but what we should do with the water once once uh, we've used it and and uh, how we take care of these things for the future well, I think we'll go for one more question and then we'll let you go because um, we need to I think we could leave you up here all day. The questions keep coming in. Um, I'll, I'll go to the last one from, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but it's from Farah Jaffery. What are the expectations yeah. from the Environment Agency on either funding the natural capital projects or commissioning mm -hmm. or conducting surveys? I think that's space to say. What are other incentives for water companies to engage and conduct more mm -hmm. on natural capital? Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> the Environment Agency actually for the water, uh, the Rivers Trust have been really very uh, supportive funders of projects where we can uh, we can uh, help to uh, restore, maintain, manage our river environments. And we are very uh, lucky uh, that we do get that support from the Environment Agency, I must say, to undertake a, a lot of work on their behalf that they don't have the, the physical resource to do that. And uh, many rivers, come, come, uh, rivers Trusts benefit that, as do the, the Wildlife Trust too, as it happens. Um, but in terms of funding natural capital projects, not specifically, but actually a lot of the work that we do with farmers, with landowners, has really started to build in our mapping of what natural capital is there. It sort of has become integrated in, in quite a lot of what we do. Um, the incentives for the water companies to engage, well, um, cynically, they're getting a lot of bad PR and... Uh, uh, Fergal Sharkey in particular has risen, uh, has really built the profile up of, of some of the horrors of what water um, uh, uh, is being done to our water by the water companies. But also Philip Dunn, to be fair, who is the Ludlow MP, has been is going to uh, bring in a public uh, private members bill about the sewage outflows um, that. Um, uh, water companies discharge from into into the house to be looked at how to make the water companies uh, clean up their act. But so some of what they're now doing is to improve their public relations. I've got, I, in my opinion, that is a very cynical opinion, but it just does happen to be. And they started to fund more environmental projects that initially don't look like water projects so working with farmers about in improving soil condition because that in um, improves infiltration uh, into and slows water flow and also retains water in in the catchment uh, that can uh, ameliorate the worst of uh, low flow um, episodes as well so i think um there is, a, there is a slow but subtle change, and I hope it will continue to improve over time. Uh, and I think, you know, the water companies are starting to fund wildlife trusts. They're starting to uh, fund rivers trusts. A number of our uh, farm advisors are funded um, through uh, the Seven Trent, as um, I know a number of farm advisors at Shropshire Wildlife Trust too, are funded that way. So I think there there are some subtle changes that are starting to occur. I'll stop there because I know you're time limited. Thank but, you, Anne. Um, Thank you. Um, just there are a few questions that are still in the chat, which we've not managed to answer. Um, yes, Anne is full of of knowledge and information uh, and then knows a lot about what's going on so if she's still here uh for the networking afterwards i don't know if you will be or not but you can always reach her through crest industry advisory board as well so um right um i'm going to um invite juliana back on now thank you very much Anne, and i'm gonna go super thank you very much vicky thank you very much Anne. informative and knowledgeable as ever we can all listen to you 
um, for hours on end. Um, so thank you. I would now like to introduce Rosanna, Rosanna Griffith. Um, Rosanna is a Principal Environmental Consultant at Stantec here in Shrewsbury. Um, recently, Rosanna's done a lot of work around natural capital and she's supported numerous clients with developing their appropriate tools um, to calculate natural capital. So very much leading on from what Anne was saying um, in terms of what um, ONS have been doing recently. One of the projects uh, Rosanna has been involved in is managing um, some work with the Environment Agency where she developed a, an approach that calculates the monetary value associated with groundwater at a catchment boundary. So today, uh, Rosanna will be presenting the approach developed under this project on the natural capital of water. So over to you, Rosanna, please. Great, thank you, Juliana, for that um, introduction. And many thanks, Anne, for your overview of natural capital. That's really helpful and very much links to my presentation. Um, even the certain documents and things that I'm going to link to later on too, which is fantastic. Um, so as Juliana's mentioned, I'm going to focus on a particular approach that we've developed for the Environment Agency um, to specifically look at the natural capital associated to groundwater uh, within a given catchment uh, boundary or spatial boundary. Uh, great, next slide. Thanks, Kat. So I will go do a bit of an intro on natural capital and groundwater specifically. Um, I'll also, as we've only got 15 minutes, it's going to be, I'm going to keep it quite fairly high level, but I'll do an intro to the approach, including applying the approach. And I'll go through some outputs um, at England scale. So not a catchment scale, but the whole of England. Great. Next slide, please, Gap. So natural capital of groundwater. Um, so with regards to uh, groundwater specifically, we'll all be aware, obviously, it's a hidden resource, um, but provides many key services. Uh, one main one being um, abstraction uh, for drinking water and bottled water, but also for agriculture and industry, um, to name just a few but many other uses through abstraction. Um, it also is used to support uh, dependent ecosystems, um, including uh, watercourses, and can act as a bit of a uh, resource during drought um, for surface water and our fluvial systems, and as well as a storage during flooding. So it can uh, provide quite a key um, supporting system uh, for our hydrological uh, approaches. Um, it obviously contributes as well to many specific sites such as wetlands um, and to name uh, many others as well and I'll get on to some examples but also um, some tourist attractions so not just um, sites that people like to walk around such as a wetland but also um, sites such as uh, Bath Spa you saw on my first slide and um, so some key tourist attractions too. So how can this resource be quantified and valued to calculate the contributions of groundwater to natural capital? That's question was kind of the aim of our approach to try and address that question. Um, we focused on groundwater specifically um, to make sure that it's captured in the wider natural capital approach. At the point of starting this project, um, and as Anne has alluded to, that quite a lot of work has happened um, on natural capital already. And the Environment Agency had made a fair amount of progress looking at um, natural capital at the catchment scale and to start off with focusing more so on surface water. So we were asked to make sure that groundwater was captured in that and to try and develop an approach to support that. Uh, next slide, please, Kat. So an introduction to the approach. So it's spreadsheet based. Um, it requires limited user input uh, to make sure that it's easy to use. Uh, a lot of the uh, spreadsheet is automated, again, to help with ease of use, to encourage uh, more people to use it and a broad range of users, hopefully. Um, 
it's linked to live data sets and it uses mainly freely available data sets again to um, help with ease of use um, by different users um, it also links to the environment agency's natural capital framework in that it which has been discussed a little bit already using looking at natural assets but also using the framework of ecosystem services and the categories um, that the Environment Agency use for those, so provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural. So again, we definitely wanted to make sure that it linked to um, tools already in use um, by the Environment Agency um, to make sure that use alongside other approaches and tools was as um, easy as possible. So uh, the user input required is just to select um, a spatial boundary or a catchment, which nicely links to um, the information that Anne was uh, presenting on, saying that that was a suitable uh, scale for these types of assessments, and we very much agree. Um, so yeah, you specify a catchment, or I've done the outputs for the whole of England, so you can choose the whole of England as an output. Uh, then all you have to do is select the year. It will default to your current year, but if you wanted to run it for economic valuation purposes for a different year you could and a time frame and again the default is 100 years but you can change that so that's all the input needs to put in and then the outputs that it will generate automatically include the natural assets that are have been identified for um, within your spatial boundary that you've specified so it will identify key natural assets um, within that spatial boundary. It will provide information on the extent and condition of those natural assets. However, keeping in mind that the tool is for groundwater only, so the natural assets that we focus on are very much just groundwater uh, relevant. Um, ecosystem services, again, so the services linked to groundwater are identified. They are quant with and then the, the use of that quantified information is then used to uh, monetize those elements and so I'll just go into applying it and now to give a bit more info on that so next slide please Kat thank you all uh, so applying it so I don't expect you to be able to read all this because it's a lot of information and it's very very small but just to give you some screenshots from the tool um, to give a bit of an overview of what it looks like the amount of information it provides, and I'll just go over um, the type of information that is shown here, but don't worry about necessarily zooming in and taking that all in, if you don't want to. <laughs> uh, so as I said, this is just, so for these outputs, all I've put in is that I'm running the approach at um, England scale, so the, for the whole of England, um, and I've run it for this year. 2021 and I've used the default of 100 years. So the outputs it gen then generates is some key uh, stats with regards to natural assets within that spatial boundary. So it first of all looks at the extent of those uh, natural assets. So again because we're focusing on uh, groundwater specifically it will mainly look at water bodies within that um, spatial boundary. Uh, and quantify the area that they cover. Um, it will pick out some key things such as chalk streams. It will also, <clears throat> excuse me, provide an average for the base flow index, which is used within the tool to provide an indication of uh, groundwater's contribution to surface water uh, services. Um, so that's quite a key value used in the tool. Uh, and so it gives an overview of um, the extent of natural assets. It will then give an overview also of the condition of those natural assets. Um, so you can see some bar charts there where it plots um, the uh, water quality status, for example, um, of key uh, water bodies uh, within your spatial boundary. So it gives an indication. Basically, this is providing, again, as Anne um, discussed, this is kind of giving you an indication of your baseline conditions. Um, so then further down on this slide, we then look at ecosystem services. So you then have an idea of what those services are linked to and uh, what assets are providing those services. Um, 
this obviously England scale um, is a very broad picture, but it can be really useful at a catchment scale because it kind of gives you your baseline conditions to uh, to go from. So uh, ecosystem services then, it, as I said, we go by the categories, the EA categories. Um, so uh, provisioning, uh, regulating, supporting and cultural. Um, so can, I think if you click, I think some other boxes will come up at the bottom. Hopefully we won't go on to another slide. There we go. And again, marvellous. Thank you. Right. So um, so provisioning. So we'll look through mainly, as I said, focusing on abstraction um, for provisioning services, but a range of uses, obviously, um, for those abstractions. Um, regulating. Can, covers hazards as you can see there but which can include flooding it also looks into water quality and carbon storage um, and on all of these the user can um, add in additional um, services that they're aware of um, within a particular catchment for example um, cultural then looks at aesthetic recreation and tourism so it looks at um, the aesthetic value um, associated to surface water that groundwater is contributing to, as well as um, specific wetlands within the area that you specified. Um, for the uh, watercourse element, we use NWEBS. I won't go into that, but people who are aware of that, uh, that's what been, has been used to calculate the monetary value of, of that particular service. Um, and then supporting services focuses because we're focusing on groundwater specifically, focuses on uh, groundwater dependent terrestrial ecosystems um, and obviously mainly being wetlands. Um, so these bits at the bottom, again, don't worry about looking at all the detail there, but the tool basically provides a quantified value for those. So it will look at the area um, of certain features or it will look at number of visits or it will look at um, basically something relevant to that particular service that we can then use to uh, apply a monetary value and we do that step we go from um, quantifying to valuing because it allows the user to then map back and um, see how that's been calculated so we're not just providing a monetary value at the end um, with difficulty in understanding how you've got there uh, thanks Kat next slide please That, thank you. So um, key outputs for England. Again, don't worry about looking at the, all the values in the top there, but that's just a screenshot of the summary that you get from um, the tool. Um, you can also, so in the code, obviously, um, a list under each subheading. So for the provisioning services, the list under there was including different types of abstraction, for example. And next to each of those is a quantified value associated to that, again, to allow you to map back. But also the tool provides the monetary value associated to each service. So you can go back to each individual service and, and review that. Um, at the top of this slide here, this is just a summary. Um, I'm hoping you can see on the left of that top box um, the key ecosystem service categories again. So it's summing the value associated to each of those uh, service types. So hopefully you can see provisioning as the top one. It's a little bit fuzzy, so I apologize for that. Um, so uh, so for England, and um, the summary of so going from running the tool, as I said, just specifying England, the scale of England um, and for 2021 and quantifying um, all key services linked to groundwater only. Um, and then it's brings that through, monetizes each of those, and then summarizes it in this top box. And from doing that, it um, has calculated that natural capital associated to groundwater only within England equates to almost 10 billion per year, 9.8 billion per year. Um, that is mainly associated to the provisioning uh, ecosystem service category, uh, which um, it calculates is 6 billion per year. Uh, regulating is three and cultural and supporting is 0.6 billion per year. Um, just to provide a little bit of context there and also which links a little bit to Anne's presentation too, I think. So uh, the Office for National Statistics in their 2020 review 
said that um, in 2018, um, for the whole of the UK, I should mention, whereas this is calculated for England, um, natural capital was estimated to be 921 billion. Um, so again, working slightly on different scales, obviously, because this is for England, but um, so groundwater alone representing about 1% of that, which is quite interesting. And obviously Anne went into uh, the natural capital associated to the forestry um, areas um, and being 24 billion in 1920. So it, it provides us with some context there of that value, um, which I think is quite useful and, and just kind of makes sure that groundwater is brought into the picture, which was the purpose of it. And I, I feel like um, a 1% contribution, albeit we need to run it on the UK to directly compare that. Um, seems relatively reasonable. I'm sure lots of hydrogeologists wouldn't agree with that. But, <laughs> um, so uh, I also the provisioning here, at 6 billion per year. Um, again, some context of the WINEP uh, for 2020 to 2025, uh, national spend of approximately 5 billion was planned and, or is planned by water companies under WINEP or NEP now um so i suppose it raises questions of um which again and alluded to is that a sufficient budget to sustain um an ecosystem service category that groundwater alone is valued at six billion per year but i i think this is why and i think this supports the what you were saying Anne, about language um i also was when we started doing work on natural capital um was a little bit reluctant to put a monetary value to the environment but i do feel that it provides <clears throat> it ensures that you're speaking the same language as for example developers so you're no longer saying um comparing a, a development for example at x billion pounds to um, the fact that they'd be going through a, a protected site with Y number of ancient trees or whatever it might be, you're, you're able to, to make a comparison to hopefully support um, environmental protection um, in valuing what we have. Um, uh, so also just to note, the cultural and supporting element here doesn't include specific sites. So that really, I, I think, should be considered as a minimum. So I mentioned Bath Spa um, previously. Um, so specific sites such as that um, isn't included here at England scale. Um, also, I've got a pie chart here. Um, this just breaks down. So we've got the categories, ecosystem service categories, but this just pulls out some key um, uh, specific services that feed that uh, fall under these categories above. Um, so this just shows that the um, key service um, from groundwater um, is for potable water, as you possibly expect. Um, mitigating hazards is then the second largest chunk from a service, a specific service uh, perspective. Energy production, carbon sequest sequestration and culture and recreation are our five top services at England scale. Um, so, and these, uh, this pie chart was developed so we can pull this information out to infographics um, easily for the EA. Um, so that's kind of a high level overview of um, the outputs for England and the approach itself and applying it and apologies I feel like I've rattled through that very quickly and I think at my last slide is just a thanks and any questions one so yeah um apologies if that was a little bit <laughs> a little bit quick I hope you all were able to follow oh, it's really interesting Rosanna thank you and it's interesting to see how much data comes in and then how it can be visualized at the end um yeah, and, and as you say, that monetary value of natural capital is not something that sits easily, I think, with most of us. Um, I was just looking to see if there's any questions in the chat. I can't see any specifically um, at the moment. I'm just going to scroll up. Okay, I've got one from Susie. 
Um, hello, Rosanna. How would this tool be used at the catchment scale, e.g. if the evaluation of groundwater service is less than the cost of remediation? Hi, Susie. I hope you're well. Um, uh, so how would it be used? Well, it can. So as I said, the user input, all that you'd need to choose is select um, the catchment scale. We've set it up so it is set up. Um, I think it's management catchment scales and um, so basically it's a EA specific catchment scales. Um, so you wouldn't be able to draw a specific catchment to run it at. Um, you'd have to select a specified WFD catchment scale, um, but it would be very easy to do that. Um, E.g. if evaluation of ground service is less than the cost of remediation. Oh, that's interesting. Um, Oh, well, I suppose, I mean, I don't know what the outcome of that would be if, if you selected it and that was the case, um, but it would allow you to be aware of that, I suppose. So um, it would be an easy way to start that discussion. Um, but yes, running it at any catchment scale, as long as it's um, a WFD catchment scale, and we've tried to cover the different types of WFD catchments, so there's an option for that. Um, it's really easy to run. Thank you, Rosanna. I'm going to leave it there just because we're running a bit behind, um, and I invite Juliana back. Thank, thank you very much, Rosanna. No worries. Okay, fantastic. Thank you ever so much for that, Rosanna. Um, it's a real whistle stop tour through, but I I love the tool that you've um, you've developed. Um, you know, and the fact that you can actually tie monetary values to, to the environment for the um, which is what we need. So thank you once again for that. Much appreciated. Uh, so our final speaker today is Sarah, Sarah Faulkner. Sarah has got um, a vast amount of experience working across a variety of agricultural sectors um, with rural businesses. She's got a fast degree in environmental management. She's uh, a full member of the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, as well as a chartered environmentalist. She's also a member of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Um, and she's a qualified uh, facts fertilizer advisor, as well as holding the basis soil and water certificate, which I learned about today. And I believe the basis soil and water certif certificate is all about looking um, at how farmers can manage um, these two vital resources in a sustainable way. Sarah, um, within the NFU now, is an environment and rural affairs advisor, and she's got the responsibility for environmental policy in the whole of the West Midlands. Here, she provides very specialist regulatory and policy advice on environmental um, matters, planning, water, waste, and land use issues. So pretty big, um, pretty big um, bag of areas there to, uh, to manage, Sarah. Sarah is a regular speaker where she presents at various regional and national um, NFU meetings. And here she covers a broad spectrum of topics um, and especially contentious issues because there are an awful lot of contentious issues within her area um, recently around uh, HS2 and flooding. Uh, Sarah today will be talking to us about the role of farming in natural capital delivery. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Sarah Faulkner. I'm the NFU's Regional Environment Advisor. Um, and the presentation I was going to give you today is very much from a, a farming perspective. And I just wanted to give you a flavour of how farmers and the agricultural sectors um, view natural capital delivery um, and a flavour of the kind of discussions that we're having. Unfortunately, there are an awful lot of discussions about natural capital and where that fits within agricultural businesses. But at this stage, there aren't a lot of answers. So I might be posing more questions than actually answering as we as we go through this. So there are three main themes that I'm going to cover today. There's the new environmental land management scheme. Um, there's new markets and opportunities through um, offsetting, etc. And then I'm going to um, cover our new in, um, integrated water management strategy. So can I have next slide? So the NFU, just a little bit about us, we're the largest farming organisation in the UK. We were founded in 1908 and we've got a network of local groups and branches. So most market towns have got a, a local um, NFU group and a local NFU branch office. 
Um, you can find additional information on all the information that I'm going to cover today on our website, which is nfuonline.com. And you can also find a fairly, fairly new report there called United by Our Environment, Our Food and Our Future, um, which covers um, the, sort of the environmental um, attributes of running a farm business. So farmers at the moment, they face a global challenge of feeding a growing and urbanising population. Um, the UK population is already is ready to approach 70 million by 2025 and 71% of agricultural of land is under agricultural management. So in terms of water, in terms of water quality and water availability, many of the environmental benefits flow from land management. So it's land management that I'm going to focus on today. So, so farmers are, are very much view themselves as custodians of the countryside and they've already embarked on a long journey of, of protecting and maintaining the British countryside. They've carried out a huge amount of work already to enhance landscapes, um, to benefit soils, um, to protect water, to look at air quality and to try to encourage wildlife. And at the moment, they're really focused on reducing our impact on the climate as well. So there's a whole host of, of, of initiatives and work already underway um, on British farms. So I'd really encourage you to have a look at, at the, the um, environment report that we've produced. And this is just the first in the series. And we're commissioning more work so that we can better understand our role in um, landscape uh, provision, biodiversity provision, soil, water and air management going forward. We've got a lot of good work to build on already on UK and Midlands farms in particular. But we've got ambitions to improve performance across all areas. So come next slide. the next slide please thanks um so oh sorry <laughs> we go back one i think it's it jumped about a bit thanks a bit um so we're farming through a re um a, a really uncertain time it's an unprecedented um, period of uncertainty uh, and that's not just because of the effects of the COVID, COVID pandemic that's also primarily because of the effects of Brexit which is which our farmers are really feeling at the moment and this is having um, a dramatic effect on, on business decision making and I've just marked out some of the challenges but then some of the opportunities that we have going forward um, and in terms of challenges, the big one there is going to be trade and trading um, trading terms going forward. We've, we're getting used to new trading arrangements um, and potentially new market opportunities going forward. But farmers have really had to adapt to, you know, changed relationships with our change trading partners, particularly the horticultural sector. It's also had an effect on on the livestock sector too. And and I think those impacts will start will will continue as we roll forward. Another consequence of the, the break with Europe has been the phasing out of cap support payments. So from 2021, the, the payments that farmers receive, um, the basic payment scheme, that will start to reduce and it will be phased out by 2028. And that, that is a, a major impact on some sectors, particularly upland livestock, um, because the, the, the previous support system was very important, um, a, a very important part of farm incomes. We've got a new um, support scheme through environmental land management scheme. So this is public money for public goods, which we've um, much Anne spoke about earlier. So this is an opportunity for a new approach, um, a new approach to, to, towards land management and a new approach to supporting land management um, and for rewarding actions that deliver public goods. Um, there are also new markets. So I think farmers are really excited by this. Um, there could be new markets for natural flood management, for water storage, for the delivery of water quality benefits. And it's something that farmers are really keen to get involved with. Some of the other opportunities that we've got um, are farmers taking ownership and coming together and working collaboratively. And um, we're seeing more of that farmers um, aligning themselves into clusters going forward. And then the final thing is the, the public support for British produce. And we really saw that last year where you know, huge numbers of uh, members of the public got behind British farming because they could see the effects of potential changes in trading relationships across the, the, the globe. And they showed a tremendous amount of support for food that's produced within the UK. So that's really positive. Can so we have the next slide, please? So the future of environment schemes is changing. Over the past 30 to 40 years, British farmers have carried out a huge amount of work within um, agri-environment schemes, and they've delivered 
benefits for water, soil, for wildlife, and they've also helped to mitigate um, the effects on climate. And during this time, there's been a really substantial amount of engagement um, with these schemes. And it's at its highest level, 70% of agricultural land was, in, was within environmental stewardship. However, in recent years, there's been a, a combination of policy changes, um, really complex scheme designs, um, under-resourcing of delivery, and um, farmers have found that the schemes are very complex to engage with. There's a lot of risk from a business point of view because the, the, there were penalties applied if you got the delivery wrong. So farm, farmers had been dropping out of these schemes, which is a real shame. And some farmers that had been you know, long-standing um, uh, deliverers of, of agri-environment outcomes had had been pushed to, to step away. So we've got a real opportunity now to look at how how we support farmers to deliver um, natural capital and public goods. So the new scheme, it, it offers a chance for innovative, innovative thinking, um, for more flexibility, for giving farmers, um, you know, the, the, the scope to actually um, look at the natural capital attributes of their land and decide how best to manage that for environmental outcomes going forward. Um, and to support, a, you know, an environmentally sustainable approach to farming, we need we need to have funding to achieve those environmental objectives because land management does cost money. It costs money to maintain hedges, um, you know, to 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 manage livestock systems. Um, to, to maintain grassland systems, etc. So there needs to be some form of income flowing into these businesses to underpin that environmental delivery. So the aspirations of going forward are to live, deliver benefits for water quality, for flood management. Um, the details on ELM are still emerging. And I think we may also need to look at other finance opportunities through new markets to, to deliver a lot of the aspirations that we have. So on the next slide, um, I've got some more information about ELM and wider uh, DEFRA policy developments. ELM is just one part of the current, um, current policy suite that's being developed. So as well as looking at the environmental land management, there are also um, animal health and welfare um, strands. There's um, an, another package looking at farming productivity and then support for rural and upland communities as well. So ELM is just one part of it. It's important because it will, be, as I said earlier, it will be, replace the bulk of money that farmers have received from the common agricultural policy. Um, so it's important to ind individual farms, but it's also important to wider rural communities as it's a key mechanism for bringing income into those communities. Um, Agri-environment schemes under, the, uh, under the, the previous regime were worth about 400 million across England. So it's a significant um, pot of funding. Um, ELM is intended to, to replace both the BPS payment and the agri-environment payment. So it's critically important to the sector and it's important that we get it right. There'll be three components to it going forward. There'll be the sustainable farming incentive, which is very much aimed at farming businesses um, and supports the deliver of natural capital measures around landscape, soil management, um, habitat creation and management, etc. And it, our aspiration for that is that it's open and accessible to all and gives all farmers an opportunity to engage with environmental management. Then we'll have the next tier up, which is local nature recovery. And this is where some more sort of capital items will come in. So there may be opportunities in here for natural flood management, for wetland habitat creation, for pond creation and management, those sorts of, um, those sorts of, of um, activities. And then the highest tier is the landscape recovery. Um, we don't know an awful lot about this, and this may potentially be the most difficult um, element for farmers, farm businesses to engage with. But this is where they start to talk about landscape recovery, about you know, large scale wetlands and coastal habitats um, and the creation of you know, land use change really on a, on, a, on, a, on a larger scale. So huge amount of questions about where that leaves someone who's farming, a, who's running an agricultural business at the end of the day. So for the next slide, so what are the goods and benefits that ELM is going to incentivize going forward? You've probably seen this list before. It's a fairly standard list of, sort of what DEFRA consider to be um, public goods. So clean air, clean and plentiful water, um, thriving plants and wildlife, um, protection from and mitigation of hazards, habitable climate and beauty, heritage and, and engagement, including recreation. And I think the key thing for us is that all the a profitable business 
is required to underpin the delivery of all these environmental outcomes going forward. And I think one of the things we're, we're most um, concerned about is to make sure that those farming businesses have got the opportunity and get to engage with this in some way. I think we're going to see a push towards you know, local delivery and local target settings. And there will be areas within the West Midlands and within Shropshire in particular, like the protected landscapes in the Shropshire Hills, et cetera, that um, you know, have, have lots of opportunities for farmers to engage with on lots of different topics. But there may be other areas which maybe don't have, um, you know, perhaps special landscapes or special environmental attributes where it may be, unfortunately, more difficult for a farmer to engage with these schemes. And that's something that, that we're working on at the moment because we, we, we do want all farmers to be able to contribute. So next slide, please. So I was just going to talk a little bit about new markets and what they are and who they are and when all this may happen, because there's an awful lot of discussion at the moment about natural capital markets and how this could be um, potentially a really big opportunity for farmers and for landowners going forward. And there are a lot of organisations out there at the moment who are positioning themselves to deliver these markets or to be brokers or to get involved in some way. And a lot of questions are being put to us by farmers and I've just flagged up a few of them um, on the slide and at this stage there are far more questions than, than answers. Um, I think the key thing though is that these markets they need to be sustainable, they need to be fair and they need to be you know treat businesses in a sort of just way and also other communities as well. I think there's it's, it's already a confusing landscape and there's potential for a lot of confusion among farmers as to you know, which of these markets are sustainable going forward and which ones to get involved with. So some of the, some of the questions we're having are, well, who's going to establish a new market and how long does it take to establish a market in this new emerging area? And there are various initiatives already out there. I just came across them the other day where they're looking to connect um, businesses that want to offset um, some form of environmental um, activity on farmland and are coming up with a, an offer for farmers, be that um, water quality or climate and carbon seems to be the big one going forward. We've also got concerns about agreements and the longevity of agreements and the brokers for those agreements. So, Farmers are being asked to commit to really long term agreements, so really significant land use change. So how can they have confidence that those brokers are going to be there into the long term to honour those commitments? Um, and do we need independent verification of the measures that farmers are being asked to deliver? And who's going to do that and who's going to sort of um, adjudicate within any dispute um, and, and actually verify the outcomes have been met? I think one of the key things that we that we um, as an organisation are looking at is the potential for layering incentives on land. So how do you layer all these different um, attributes that a piece of land is able to deliver? So would you be able to have an environmental land management um, scheme? Would you be able to layer that with um, a carbon credit? Would you be able to in get involved in a water company catchment scheme? And how would that all fit like a jigsaw on a land holding? Um, or does becoming involved in one of those exclude you from the others. So these are all questions that we need to answer going forward. Collaboration is a big um, a big theme going forward. And lots of people are very keen that farmers should work together collaboratively to um, deliver environmental outcomes. And farmers and advisors will tell you that this is really difficult, but they are already doing this in lots of ways. I mean, the farmers are coming together through facilitation groups or clusters. But they already work together through machinery sharing, through share farming, you know, through, to, to, to collaborating on lots of different aspects of running a farm business. So we're finding our way with this, but um, there probably are ways that, um, that we can work together more closely going forward. And then the final thing is to look at putting in the right option in the right place, because we're already seeing competing offers for land use. So, you know, lots of organisations out there at the moment are offering free tree schemes because they're really keen to get going for climate action. But we need to take a step back and go, well, you know, is that being done in a way that considers the environmental attributes of putting trees on that land? And is it being considered in a way that looks at the trade-offs for food production? Because we do need to make sure that we keep an eye on food sustainability and make sure that we you know, keep the ability to feed ourselves as a nation. Otherwise, we're just exporting our, um, our food food needs going forward, which again, has got lots of environmental questions about the, the, the sense of doing that. So next slide, please. 
So I've just picked on two um, issues which are probably more developed than the others. So net gain and offsetting. So the Environment Bill in 2020, that puts the environment, um, uh, puts the 25 year environment plan onto a statutory footing. And it contains really ambitious scale of, of biodiversity delivery. Um, it also introduces mandatory biodiversity net gain within the planning system for the first time. And that, again, brings up lots of questions for farmers. So farmers as developers, but also farmers potentially as offsetters as well. So, you know, the, uh, the NFU's view on, on these schemes going forward is that govern, government needs to balance any future net gain policies with the use of land as a resource for food production. Um, it also should it should, all, should, it should all should be introduced in a way that it doesn't slow down the planning process because the planning process is also is already very slow, um, you know, and very expensive for, for all parties involved. So we want to make sure that um, you know adding this additional element in doesn't slow down things even further. And we also need to have policies in place that make it practical to deliver and offer values value for money to developers, to government, to communities, but also to farmers as well. They need to work with farmers because we would argue that for net gain delivery to become re realistic, the majority of those offset providers are going to have to come from the land management sector. Um, and with those, without those offset providers coming forward, the market in the future isn't going to function because the land bank may not be there. Um, and then in terms of taking land out of production, you know that's a concern for us. So therefore, our um, sort of view on that going forward is that we should look at the areas on the farm that have a lower inherent inherent fertility and try to put in these offset areas into the um, sort of areas of the farm that are probably not not as productive for food production going forward. And farmers can probably find um, areas on their farm that lend themselves to these sorts of uses going forward. Um, and you'll end up with patchworks and pockets of, um, of different sorts of habitat types um, across farm, the farmed landscape going forward. Um, so the next slide, please. So I'm going to finally talk about the NFU's new integrated water management report. Um, this is, again, it's available on our website, website nfuonline.com. Um, it was released in February this year, so it's relatively new. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll take you through a few slides on it. But basically, this is our thinking about how integrated water management is going to work over catchments and how farmers are going to be involved with that going forward. So next slide, please. So recently, um, most of our attention within the NFU has been focused on flooding for obvious reasons. That's been our most pressing concern as it's affected a huge amount of our members all over the country in different ways. But then looking back just last summer and then 2018, we were dealing with really high rainfall and um, really high temperature, sorry, and low rainfall and an agricultural drought, um, um, the second agricultural drought in three years. And that affected all producers, not just the sort of irrigated crop producers in the east and the, and the south. It affected li upland livestock, it affected horticulture, it affected arable sectors, and, and the, the, the effects of that were, were really widespread. It touched every farming type and every region within the, within the country. So as a combination of these extreme, this, these extreme events that we've been having has, has sort of left us to wondering as a sector whether we're moving towards a new normal in terms of weather patterns, and therefore we need to plan for that going forward. So we need to focus as an NFU on how we can best support our members respond to these dry weather challenges and then focus on flooding emergencies that may come quite frequently afterwards. So in, 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 recently, we've um, hosted ministerial drought summits. We're developing opportunities for abstraction license flexibility to help growers. Um, and we're working with water companies to minimate, minimize the effect of main supply disruptions on livestock farms. So it's becoming a, a big area of work for us. But it's important for us to think beyond the sort of knee-jerk emergency response, which is what we've been doing the last couple of years, and start to put together um, a more integrated approach to managing these challenges that come with a changing climate. So next slide, please. Um, so farmers, um, you know, they, they, they will be an area where they're able to provide a service in mitigating flood risk to help protect other communities. And this needs to be a planned element of total catchment management going forward. 
farmers need to be fairly compensated for flood mitigation delivery by providing, you know, if they're going to provide land that can be flooded seasonally to reduce the severity and frequency of flooding down downstream, then, then there needs to be um, an appropriate payment to go with that management activities. Farmers and growers are already adapting their businesses to make them more resistant to resistant and resilient to extreme weather. So we're looking at on-farm interventions to improve um, runoff attenuation, um, putting in rural suds features. We're also adopting improved soil uh, cultivation techniques to lock moisture into soils for the benefit of both water quantity and water quality and to mitigate surface water flooding in, um, in, in um, sensitive catchments. We're also adopting on-farm flood and drought risk management and contingency planning by relying on improved forecasting of weather and water availability. And I think it's the resilience element of it that, that's really come to the fore in the Midlands, where we're working with members to look at you know, what, what tools do people need to be able to um, manage in either a flood event or a, a drought event? You know, have they got vessels where they could take delivered water to ensure that, that livestock have access to water during droughts, etc. So a lot of planning going forward. Um, so next slide, please. So our, our strategy document provides a description of the extreme weather risks that we're facing. Um, and we, we look at each of the farming sectors, so horticulture, dairy, arable, etc. And then we've also produced a set of short supplementary commentaries on, on the wider climate risks facing, facing each re region. And if you go onto NFU online, there's one there that we've prepared for the West Midlands that outlines the, the key issues for farmers in the area. So a lot of, we've also put together a lot of member case studies. And these show that farmers are already taking steps to make their businesses more resilient to the risk of water scarcity. They're capturing and storing surplus water in tanks and reservoirs. They're using smarter, more targeted application of waters to crops so that they exactly fit crop requirements. Um, and we think that in the future, um, the pressure on, on sort of water resources might become so great that, um, you know, all farms at an individual level will become involved. So co cooperation um, and collaboration within the farming community is really important to this going forward and also with other sectors as well. And we're already working with water companies to look at shared resources um, and I think the regional uh, water resources planning groups, you know, they're starting to look at the needs of agricultural businesses as well going forward so that they can be integrated into wider water resources planning regionally. Um, I think uh, next slide, please. So in launching the strategy, the vision is that um, agriculture has got a central role to play in the sustainable use of land and of water going forward. And we also need to continue to feed the nation. So it's really important um, that we um, you know, that we, we make space for water for farming going forward. And this is really important because some three quarters of the water embedded into the food that we eat is imported from water stressed areas within the globe. So you look at places like Spain and Chile and the amount of fresh produce coming in. That's all embedded water. So we really need to consider that um, going forward because those countries have got even greater climate risks than the UK. Um, and we also need to try to understand the long term impacts for global trade following Brexit and the risk of food, food supply uh, disruptions going forward. And we've seen that with the pandemic recently. So there's a real opportunity out there for our farmers to deliver climate friendly food produced locally that can help, um, help to insulate us from some of these global risks going forward. So our vision is that we would have a, a fair share of water for agriculture and for horticulture and that we establish the agri-food sector as an essential user of water going forward, that we drive technological innovation to improve flood management and water use, um, and that we further develop agricultural productivity so we're, while protecting the environment as well. So next slide, please. So um, I should have said at the outset that our water strategy is conceived as a, as a companion piece through our commitment to achieve net zero by 2040. And again, you can find more information about that on NFU online. And it's really important that we've opened up other conversations with other sectors going forward. And we want this water strategy to do the same. So we've included a set of pledges within that document that you can have a look at. And our members are committed to forward planning and to really focusing on water as an issue. So next slide, which I think is the last one. So food production and land management policies must go hand in hand going forward. 
There needs to be a fair financial payment for the services provided by agricultural businesses. Um, participation in agri-environment schemes as offset providers and within these new markets must be voluntary. And farmers must have a choice of who to engage with and who to deal with going forward. And we should support the sector going forward along its journey to achieving net zero and also to um, securing water for food going forward. And that's it. Thank you, Sarah. You managed to get through quite a bit then. <laughs> we do have a few questions for you in the chat. Um, I know you've got a, another event a bit later on, so I'll, I'll go for the top three um, and we'll send the rest to you later on. There's now eight questions, um, so they're all popping in. So if there, there's questions uh, to the audience that you really want to ask, you need to vote them up so they get to the top as you won't get to them. So I'm going to start with the one with two votes at the top. Um, Sarah, do you believe there is scope within ELMS and other policies to focus on the quality of the management of our natural capital, or will it just be about the amount of natural capital? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's always been a quality element within there, because when you look at the way the old um, countryside stewardship was structured, there were different payments for different, for, you know, if you look at the grassland, for example, there was different payment rates depending on the quality of that grassland. Going forward, there's been a lot of work done on different payment systems, and that, as I understand it, is still ongoing. So there has been a move towards looking at outcome-based systems, and you can see that there are advantages to that because they they incentivize um, you know farmers to produce higher quality habitats but there's also risks there as well because we've seen some of the trial work that's been going off up in the in Yorkshire where farmers have put in a lot of time in plug planting uh, species into grasses and everything and then you'll have an extreme weather event and it unpicks it all so there needs to be that safety net there as well that enables farmers to move forward okay thank you Sarah um there's a lot there to get through. Um, Sarah, based on what you mentioned regarding existing social capital and collective actions already exist among farmer communities, how 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 will they are those used as drivers for farmers to collaborate on natural capital, social capital? I think it's just um, it's, I think it's um, just recognising that those networks already exist, and there are net, lots of networks within agriculture looking at all sorts of different um, attributes of the environment. So there are soils discussion groups. There are networks that look at you know cropping um, and look at the economics of cropping. So you know they can probably lend themselves to looking at some of these natural capital issues going forward. And it's about not reinventing the wheel. Because I think if we just look at, at sort of purely natural capital, there isn't a lot going on, but there's an awful lot of other issues that probably lend themselves to contributing in some way. And we don't want to have to go out there and re reinvent all these groups that are already operating. Mm. OK, we've got a question from Oliver, which has got, gone straight to the top. Um, how cohesive is the opinion of the community of farmers on long term climate change management strategies? Are there significant minority well, voices? That's interesting. It's it's always very difficult when you is when you represent a very wide range of businesses with a huge variety of views on all sorts of things, whether that be Brexit or um, you know any, you name it. There, there will be a, always within our membership a diversity of views, but we have a democratic structure, so um, you know all our policy is discussed by our farming members, um, and and they're the ones that come up with. And I know that there you know a few farmers raised eyebrows when we came out with that net zero aspiration. Um, and some people are worried by it. And, and obviously you would be because this really fundamentally impacts upon your farming business. But equally, there are farmers out there who can see um, see the, the massive opportunities. And I think it's important to realise that the net zero is across the whole sector. It's not on the individual farm. So we're not expecting every individual farm to achieve net zero. But as a collaborative effort across the sector, we think it's doable. There's, there's various questions about how land gets valued, how it gets graded, what land might be left for offsetting net zero um, for those who aren't landowners. Um, so there's lots of chat going on there. Um, I think I'm going to I'm going to leave it there. Um, Sarah, it, it, thank you so much.